All right. Uh, <coughs> nope, thought I was ready. Oh, no way. Oh my God. No way. Oh my God. Six of one million of the Serial Chillers podcast from the Super Network Studio. I am here with Hella Greg. He is in the Super Network bunker, sixty-six point six feet directly below us. And I ask you, how goes it, Hella Greg? I'm good. I'm good. Just getting that core workout on. Yeah, I saw that. It was almost a disaster. <laughs> one. <laughs> and we'll, we'll be back at it tomorrow. Well, uh, don't forget, everybody, to follow the show anywhere you can. Uh, Facebook is Serial Chillers Podcast. The Facebook group is of the same name. So is the Instagram and the Gmail address. Twitter is at Chillers Podcast. You can call or text the show at 1-805-666-2513. SerialChillersPodcast.Threadless.com for merchandise. We just added a ton of... By the time this airs, it'll have been out a while. But we just added a ton of new designs. Uh, SerialChillersPodcast.com for stickers. Rate and review on everything if you can. And if you'd like to give to help the show, we just also added some new levels to the Patreon, which is Patreon.com slash SerialChillersPodcast. So a bunch of new merchandise and shit that's available for that. Yes. So let's get... To, I, I'm getting good at that. I used to take a lot longer to get through that, man. Uh, let's welcome uh, one back and one for the first time. Ooh. We'll welcome back uh, my sister, Kim. What up? Hello, and completing the trifecta that is Bigfoot, Caitlin, and now Chelsea. Ooh, Welcome. And the place to be. We have now had all the Bigfoot siblings on the show. Yay, oh, baby. The baby, the baby is Bigfoot. The baby Bigfoot is here, and uh, oh, she's ready to get a W. Oh, absolutely. She, since you've rearranged the room, it's hard for me to tell. Is that like the Bigfoot nest? That she sits in? Yeah. Technically, where I sit now is what used to be the Bigfoot nest, but I need to see the TV when I'm working, so yes. So that's the new Bigfoot nest. It's been moved across the corner, so you are sitting in the Bigfoot nest. Casey's farted in this chair. Almost certainly. (laughs) Almost certainly. (laughs) Almost purposefully. (laughs) He's like, she'll be here eventually. (laughs) Sometimes I compress the cushion so it holds it in there. (laughs) Next person to sit in it lets it out. So you guys know how the show... Well, welcome. Welcome, both of you. You know how the show works. Let me explain it for anybody that doesn't. Each week, I sit down with old friends, new friends, good friends, and bad friends to tell the story of an infamous serial killer. Throughout the show, you guys can chime in on my story, and if you brought a story of your own that is true crime, dark, creepy, unsolved, or otherwise mysterious, please feel free to share it. Lastly, if you have questions about questions, make sure to ask questions, because I cannot answer questions about questions if you never ask questions. Are, are there mm-hmm. any questions? No. no. No questions. Then welcome to, and let's play, the Serial Chillers podcast. <laughs> wow. I was waiting for more. <laughs> yeah. We were really about to get it it's, right there. It is quite short. <laughs> All right. Today's serial killer is, tell me, have you heard of Lemuel Smith? No. Lemuel, Lemuel. Mm. I'm not sure. I wasn't sure how to pronounce it. And every I'm pretty sure it's Lemuel. Lemuel. I do believe so. Okay, because the documentaries you go, you go with your gut because you're the one that did the research. I'm the one that stayed up all night watching garbage. Um, I think it's hard not to say Lemuel because that's what I saw first. It's fine. Go with your gut. I, I'll but, back you. But I, I look at it and I'm like, you wouldn't say Samuel when you say, saw the name Samuel. Which this is just looks like a, oh, a play sense. on. Mm-hmm. So um, I apologize to anybody with this name uh, that I'm mispronouncing, but you should hear me say upstate New York names, which there are some in here. Although we did just get a bunch of positive feedback for knocking out of the park some of those Hungarian names. Yeah, goddamn right. I practiced those. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So question number one, as always, in what year was L- Lemuel Smith born. Lemuel. Lemuel. 
What was old? What year was old Fuckface Smith born? There we go. Fixed it. I'm oh, pronouncing it. I'm pronouncing Fuck it correctly face. now. 250 points to the closest. 1,000 if you can nail it. All right. We got our guesses. Yes. Uh, don't look over there. You can't save you now. Kim says 1916. Ooh, you went old. I went 1943. 43. Mm-hmm. Baby, good guess. Lemuel Smith was born July 22nd, 1941. Oh. So 250 points. Very close uh, to nailing it on the first question. Uh, ooh, you're, you're just like your mother. You just come here and you're encouraging to your opponents in defeat. because <laughs> she's a sweet angel. Just have to, just have to lift people up, okay? Just have to lift people down. Shy was... <clears throat> Mama Shy was on the last episode with uh, your your brother Clayton, Aww. and uh, as Clayton began to take some leads, she became very supportive of him. Aww. So there's, <laughs> she just too. she just likes to see people succeed. That's exactly. all. That's yeah. really all. <clears throat> uh, last time Paul smoked her, and at the end he was like, "This isn't even fun. I like to bash the people I'm beating, and she's just being too nice. Like I'm not even enjoying this." I'm so proud. You're doing of you. so great, sweetie. Yay. <laughs> that's like that's almost exactly what she was like. Is it so cute. Aww. Okay, Lemuel Smith is born in Amsterdam, New York. Um, he had a brother named John who was older than him, but actually died before he was born of encephalitis. Hmm. Uh, between 41 and 53, f- so from birth to the age of 12, he's going to sleep in his parents' bed with his mother while his father is at work in the evenings. He's like a... I can't remember exactly what he did in the evenings, but he was a pastor on the weekends and uh, sometimes during the day. So he's he's a preacher's son. Um, was, the, was the son of a preacher man? <clears throat> that is, yes, he was. yeah. I was. I mean, I was trying not to get any copyright hits on this episode, but that's yeah. why I said it with that inflection <laughs> instead of going. Was the son of a preacher man? Blew it. Damn, <laughs> blew it. Uh, nailed it. I keep using my mouse to try to control the iPad. God damn it. <clears throat> okay, so from, uh, in 1946, when he's only five years old, he gets a major head injury on an, uh, in a bicycle accident. Uh, he said it's part of that one thing. Yeah. McDonald triad. That's the one. So major head injury is a, um, no, it actually, God damn it. I always forget it. Son of a bitch. Well, I, man. I know you know it, but as soon as I throw some bad, information that's exactly out there. because it, it's like, I have four things in my mind. Yeah. And so there's one that's not part of it. And I think animal bedwetting, fire, head injury, head injury is not one of them. Fire, bedwetting and, uh, animals are the three. Head injury is just like a sign of some serial. A lot of serial killers have had a head. Look it up. Just look it up for me real quick, producer Greg. <laughs> producer Greg, work. You're not producer. I was Greg like, anymore. man, I wish somebody would get on that. <laughs> oh yeah. So, have you guys heard of the McDonald Triad? No. Greg does do this to me. I swear to God, I'd know it. And every time he's like, "Wait, isn't it?" And I'm like, "Wait, is it?" And I totally start questioning my <laughs> yeah. entire reality. Also known as the Triad of Sociopathy or the Homicidal Triad, it's a set of three factors been suggested that if any three of the combination of the two are present together, the predictive or associated would be later violent tendencies. Right, but what are they? Uh, oh, the- fucking garbage. Oh. Wait, hold on. I got it. I I always type McDonald Triad and look at an image. In fact, ah, good idea. Oh wait, arson, cruelty to animals, mm. and uresis. Yeah, so no head injury. It's piss in the bed. <laughs> uh, arson, animals. I so let's edit this out because we've already had people talk shit about the fact that we don't know the McDonald Triad. Well, it's not like we're a true crime <laughs> podcast. Get out of here. <laughs> um, I wonder if the head injury is just like uh, it's just a common thing. Like it's a well, common. I wonder if that's what fucks up like the reasoning center and like mm. the the impulse control and stuff like that. Well, we'll see with Lemuel that this is not the last major head injury he's gonna have. So some of oh, them have good. So one. He probably has like chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Yeah, very good. And his brother died from encephalitis. So, <laughs> so um, he. He starts begging for his brother, John, who he never met, to come back to Earth after this head injury. His mom thought, like, at first it was a you know a concussion and, like, he's asking a little weird after the day or two. But, like, six months in when every day he was just like, please, Lord Jesus, bring back my brother, John. Bring him back to Earth. They were, uh, they were starting to get a little concerned, but not concerned enough to do something about it. It's the 40s, you guys. If you say your kid is crazy, they're just going to, like, they're gonna institutionalize put them. They're going to crazy and, kids huh? and then not feed them. So they were a like a good supportive family. Like I said, he was the son of a preacher man. His mother was a stay at home mother, but, um, she was very, very, um, loving. There was no sign of any abuse. And that's just one of the differences we'll see in a lot of serial killers, but he does have, 
a few things in common, starting at a very young age, too. So in 1947, his mom said the personality of Limo emerges. Uh, this is like one of his multiple personalities. Mm. He's got two majors, which is going to be Limo, and uh, I think the other one is called John. So those two oh. two major personalities are like prevalent at like an age before 13, his mother recognizes. Limo sounds fun. Yeah, Limo, I think, is an asshole. Uh, well, I, <laughs> probably, but he sounds fun. In summer of 1951, he gets another head injury from falling from a tree while playing Tarzan and was unconscious for several minutes. So a lot of people think like getting knocked unconscious is like in the movies where you get knocked unconscious and they're like, all right, we've got five minutes. Let's do this. Like, if that's the case, that person probably has brain damage. Like, you should wake right up almost from getting knocked unconscious. Uh, he was down for like five to seven minutes, they said. Oh, so nice. he was just like, oh, oh, and they're like, watch out for that tree. And then it just mixed <laughs> Georgia the Jungle and Tarzan together, and it became a, an injury. Uh, <laughs> I had to save myself there. <laughs> nice day. Nice yeah, thank save. You, thank you. Thank you. Um, a help from his friend and ape named Dave. <laughs> So, in 1947, later, uh, Limo is going to emerge even more heavily. Uh, 1951 to 58, uh, from a very young age, he would show very predatory actions. He would stalk, kiss, and touch, and manually penetrate girls in the neighborhood against their will. Mm. From 1952 to 1958, he receives his third and fourth head injuries while snow sledding back-to-backs, and a fifth head injury while playing basketball. Brain is so by, by 58, he he's 17 now. <laughs> yes. He's got a soft skull, it sounds like. He's got five major head injuries. It's like varsity blues. Like, you can't play another down of football. I like the I like the back-to-back head injuries. Like both the, snow sledding. Yeah, like he wrecked and got up and was like, I'm all right, I'm all, I'm alright. And then they like drug him back up the hill and he did it again. And <laughs> I got it this time. Don't worry. <laughs> Hit the and other side of his head. It was like um like that scene from Sorry from Flip when Ardo Sorry fell down the stairs and they had to animate it. That's gnarly. That was one of the gnarliest things ever. All of, <laughs> our, all of our skate video it. fans out there remember that. Look it up if you've never seen it. Oh, it's gnarly. That bump on his skull was like, I thought it was makeup the first time I saw it. Oh, and then they had to animate it because it was too gruesome to show. I think it might not have been rolling. Like they, they, were, they were warm up. Um, That's 50s. why you record everything, dudes. Yeah. Okay, so in the summer of 1951, 52, 58, nope. Question number two. He's got these five major head injuries, y'all. What did he stop participating in that worried his mother the most? Was it A, basketball, B, family game night, C, church, or D, school? What did he quit doing that concerned his mother the most? Basketball, family game night, church or school, A, B, C, or D? Uh, Kim said school. Chelsea says school. He refused to attend church with his family. He was the son of a preacher man, and he said, nah, nah, I'm not going to church anymore. So no points for anybody on that one. Uh, He stayed in school, kids, as you should. Uh, If you don't like church, quit going. That's my. Yeah. Uh, that's no, my. I agree with that. That's my. That's my uh, point for you there. Uh, you know, just uh, hail Satan. Uh, hail Satan. Yeah. Nineteen fifty-three. Yeah. So he begins to refuse. He begins <laughs> to um, refuse church. He's got some head injuries, and he's just not. Uh, that boy ain't right. In December of 57, he is uh, indicted. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we were watching a true crime channel where the girl kept saying indicted, and I was like, God damn it. This is oh, automatically, knew? this is not. Uh, okay, so December of 1957, he's indicted for burglary of, uh, of Stretch's Coffee Shop and Ritchell's Confectionery Store in Amsterdam, New York. I don't know why I had to pronounce those that way, but it only seemed right. It sounds tastier when you say it like yeah, that. Yeah, Stretch's Coffee and Ritchell's Confectionery Store. In in New York, though? Yeah, Amsterdam. Well, hey, yeah, we all the, all the, it's, all those, it's all those New York Texans. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, that's just what, I guess that's the natural uh, accent that hits me it's first. It's the only way I can say Ritchell's? <laughs> that's true, too. I'm walking here. 
So, uh, January 21st, 1958, a woman named Dorothy Water Street was robbed and beaten to death in her neighborhood while walking through the grocery store parking lot. Uh, This also takes place in Amsterdam, New York. On the 23rd of January, two days later, Lemuel was determined to be a suspect in the murder and brought in for questioning. However, it is said that the DA was too hasty in trying to extract a confession, and the case fell apart right in front of them. Lemuel was never actually arrested for the crime. So the DA was too hasty in trying to extract a confession. Case falls apart. Lemuel never even arrested for what is almost assuredly uh, him beating a woman to death for her purse. In the summer of 1958, he's going to move to Schenectady, New York, to live with his sister Edith, his older sister. Uh, In July of 58, a woman named Edna Johnson was beaten near to death while out on a walk one night. The weapon used was a 15-inch steel pipe. He was interrupted by a witness this time, which led to the fact that Lemuel was nearly immediately a main suspect, and a few days after, uh, he was arrested for the crime and taken to jail. On January 20th, 1959, he's 17 years old now. They They were still pretty... Pretty early on in life. Mm -hmm. Uh, The trial for Edna Johnson assault begins, and it goes fairly quickly, and he'll be sentenced only three months later. Question number three. What is the sentence he is given? Is it A, five to ten years? B, one to three years? C, probation? Or D, no more than 20 years? Five to ten, one to three, probation, or no more than 20 years? It's one of these. All right, Kim, what do you got? Uh, one, two, three. <gasps> Bitch. Both of them say one to three years. <laughs> That's because we finish each other's <laughs> sentences. <laughs> and neither Sandwiches. of them, yeah, <laughs> neither of them get any points. <laughs> they are soulmates, but it, hey, that it means seems, though. I'm still in the lead. Yes, yep. you are. With, you are doing great. <laughs> with a 250 to zero lead. Uh, Chelsea is running away with this thing. Got it in the bag. And she's very humble about it, too. <laughs> she was just doing the Arsenio Hall fist pump, if anybody cares. I almost didn't recognize it without the woof. <laughs> okay, so on January 12th, 1959, at the age of 17, he is sentenced to a maximum of 20 years by Judge Joseph Brines. In August of 1958 through January 59, he is in jail at the Baltimore Penitentiary. And in 1959 through 1968, he's going to be in prison and spend much of his time in solitary confinement because he couldn't get his motherfucking shit together. He is a dickhead. Uh, In 1964, it'll be the first chance that he's eligible for parole and is denied. In the summer of 64, a riot at the prison uh, breaks out. Uh, Lemuel seems to have been involved but not responsible. In 1966, he has a second chance and eligibility for parole. It is also going to be denied. Uh, He's going to get out after this second one, I think, because they gave him no more than 20, and you can't serve. um, I can't remember the exact law. It was some stupid shit. So he gets out after um, about 10 times. I, I can't remember exactly what it is. But against his parents' wishes, Lemuel converts to Catholicism. He is appointed a chaplain's assistant. Um, in March of 1967, the burglary charges are dismissed by Judge Crangel. Uh, and I actually gave you guys an answer because it's right here. I'm just trying to do it off the top. So uh, we'll, I'll give you guys both 250 instead of uh, giving you guys zero because this is when he gets his third chance at parole and he is given a yes. It was going to be a 50-50 anyway. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, he, he was just saying, hey, did you get parole? Yes. See. Yeah, all right. 250 points to each of you. All right, so it's 500 to 250. He comes on the board. Okay. <laughs> I forgot that he converted in prison. I was like, wait, why did I put that he converted right here? And I haven't even said that he got out of prison yet, so I tried to. But uh, I'm dumb. So he's approved for parole on his third time around, and he's looking for a job for a few months uh, after he uh, has gotten out. So he gets out in April, and in August of 1968, he's going to get a job. Question number five, what does he get a job doing? Is it A, working at a sheet metal plant, B, as a custodian, C, as a plumber, or D, working in a solvent factory? Sheet metal, custodian, plumber, solvent factory. That last one sounds smelly. Fumey, maybe. All right, so Kim says as a custodian, Chelsea says that he worked in a sheet metal plant. Chelsea going to extend her lead because he did indeed oh, work at my. a sheet metal plant. Ooh, child. <laughs> Ooh, child. 
Um, <laughs> so he's working at a sheet metal plant in May of 1969. He kidnaps and sexually assaults a woman who managed to escape. Later that same day, he kidnapped and raped 46-year-old friend of his mother's. When that woman uh, convinced Smith to let her go, he was arrested again when she immediately went to the police. In June of 1969, he is indicted on charges of robbery, kidnapping, and possession of dangerous weapons. November 11th, 1969, he is sentenced to 4 to 15 years for attempted rape and assault of one of the women and false imprisonment of his mother's friend by Judge Archibald Wimple. In September of 1971, while incarcerated, he was also involved in another riot at Attica Prison. In 1973, he's going to have his first parole hearing in which he will be denied. In 1975, his second parole hearing will also be denied. And February of 1976, he is granted parole after serving seven years in prison. So, he gets, you know... He's a lucky guy. Yeah, he he served, I think, nine of his no more than 20, and this time he served seven of his four to 15. So he did serve over the minimum, which we can be thankful for, I guess. <laughs> but fuck, man. <clears throat> Merka! Justice. Uh, question thinking about him rioting, going, Attica! <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so he gets a parole. I, now I can only see Charlie Kelly yelling that. Uh, really, I see uh, Jason Matsukas uh, going, Gattaca, yeah. <laughs> running out with the paintball guns. Uh, question number six. After being granted parole for the third time, how long would he be out of prison before committing his first major crime? No, no oh, multiple choice okay. on this one. Closest to the answer gets 250 points. 1,000 if you can nail it. How long is he going to be out? Like, will there be, will there be prison could be prison hours. Prison. Could be months. Yeah, yeah. Some specificity could help. Right. Are you staring me down? You think you're going to get the answer from my eyeballs? Yeah, I'm cheating. I told oh. you she's a cheater. Morse code. Do you want cheating? All right. Well, what do you got, Chelsea? Five months, four days. Kim says two months. I am going to give 1,000 points to Chelsea. 1,000? Because he did commit a crime uh, in July after getting out in February, which is five months Pichu. later. Pichu. So 1,000 points. Yeah, well, pump, yeah. uh, nailed it. Hey, Kim. Oh. Wow. You're yeah, not cheating very good. <laughs> God, I know. Do it, Damn it. Do the opposite of what you're doing. Oh, okay. Okay, so Chelsea has 1,750 really points. Kim yes. has 250 points. Uh, that I, I really gave her. Zero. <laughs> <laughs> I really, let's be honest. So, how many it. questions do we have today, Greg? Was it? It's only, I think it's only like thirteen. So, score more, Cam. Oh, I'm supposed to score points. I'm supposed to answer them right. <laughs> this isn't golf. Okay. <laughs> so, five months after getting out of prison on July 21st, 1976, he kidnaps, rapes, kills, and mutilates Marilee Wilson, who is 30 years old in Schenectady, New York. Her body was said to have been scarred, uh, severely beaten, and even veteran police officers were completely disgusted by the sight. Uh, she also had uh, bite marks all over her body as well. On July 21st, 1976, Lemuel is spotted in the vicinity of J Street, where Marilee Wilson worked as a sex worker by patrolman Arthur Chairs. Captain Sheenman requests and receives a search warrant for Lemuel's apartment, but nothing of any importance is found. July 22nd, 1976, the body of Marilee Wilson is. 1976, later that month, a law is passed requiring the release of an inmate after the prison had completed double the amount of his minimum sentence. So that was the law we're talking about. So now if he goes in <clears throat> and he gets four to 15 years. Uh, and he serves eight, he they, gets to leave. He, he has gets, to leave. They've got to let him go. Okay. Yeah. Which is. Hey. Yeah. Complete Which is like a, a just a testament to our prison system and how they they're all about rehabilitating people and you know getting them back out rather than you know <laughs> creating some sort of system that keeps people coming back and reoffending. Justice is served. Pol political podcasts may come later. <laughs> so <laughs> we're looking at you, podcast. Bigfoot, <laughs> on July twenty second, nineteen seventy six. That's sorry. sorry. <laughs> 
Later in 1976, he is going to be released on parole and denied permission to apply for a motor vehicle license uh, by jo- Officer Joe Early and diagnosed with schizophrenia by Joe Early. He's required to un- undergo psych exams before he is allowed to take a driving test. <clears throat> Wait a second. This guy's a parole officer and he's out here diagnosing people with schizophrenia? Yeah, that's what I thought when I read it too, but God damn it, there's just nothing about this guy. So I don't know if... The diagnosis came from a doctor, and that's what the the PO is saying. Or, but at, at any rate, that's what I've got here. So um, I don't know. Yeah, got yeah, my yeah, eye yeah. on you, Joe Early. <laughs> Joe, Joe Early, we're fucking watching you. Right here. Um, I think maybe in maybe Joe Early is more saying, "I think this guy's got this shit. I'm going to require him to take a psych exam before he can get the driving test. Before he can take the driving test, like he's just got to pass this." I think he's a fucking lunatic. If he passes it, NBD, he goes for it, man. <clears throat> November 24th of 1976, he's going to kill Robert Hederman, who is 48, and Margaret Byron, who is 59, in the back of Hederman's store in Albany, New York. Robert had his throat, quote, violently slashed, according to the police report. Margaret had been manually strangled to death. The register was empty, but none of the products from the store had been taken. Question number seven. What type of store did he own? Was it a pack and ship store, a bookstore, a grocery store, or a store for religious goods? Pack and ship, bookstore, grocery store, religious goods. You know, like. Definitely uh, thought it was an adult novelty store. Statues of Baphomet, uh, uh, several. Sounds like a cool place where somebody who like sweats and cries blood would hang out. I made a misspelled word on accident. Kim religious. says uh, Kim couldn't spell goods, so <laughs> religious goods for Kim. Uh, package chip for Chelsea. Kim is on the board again. Oh, Another two hundred and fifty for Kim because yes, indeed, he robbed the store blind of money, but did not take a single piece of religious good. Not even like a what would Jesus do bracelet. Just curious, how much money could possibly be at a religious good store? <clears throat> that I do not know, and that information I was not given. Let's imagine that it was seven billion dollars. Oh my god! Yep. yep. <gasps> so November twenty fifth. Uh, he is questioned at work regarding the Hederman Byron murder, and he claims to have been with his girlfriend, Jenny Healy, who is 17. I was with my underage girlfriend, I swear. <laughs> so in winter of 1976, they searched Lemuel's work locker. Um, they found one gray hair, which is later identified as Margaret Byron's. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, crack police work right there. December 6, 1976, Lemuel is identified in a photo lineup by Maureen Toomey, another woman that he had attacked, who was also a sex worker. Uh, She didn't obviously get killed by him, but she got uh, her ass kicked by him. On December 23, 1976, Joan Richburg, who is 24, is raped and killed and mutilated in Schenectady, New York. The next day, Joan Richburg's body is found. That's Christmas Eve. Merry Christmas. December 1976, he is picked up for questioning in Schenectady and taken to the Loudonville, New York State Police Barracks. Question number eight. A specialist is brought in to assist with the Hederman Byron investigation. What type? Is it A, a blood splatter specialist? B, a clairvoyant? C, a criminal profiler? Or D, a human tracker? Oh, shit. They're just going to put their ear to the ground and follow them out there. A blood splatter evidence expert, clairvoyant, a criminal profiler, or a human tracker. Hmm. Did you ever see that show? It's like a reality show where they like give people like a two mile head start and they send a dude on a horse after him. You fucking man tracker. Yeah, that's what it was called. Show, dude. Yeah, that show. Had an badass. application filled out and sent in. Dang. Okay, what type of specialist is brought in, guys? Blood splatter, clairvoyant, criminal profiler, or a human tracker? You wouldn't believe what Greg just had to cut out of this. All right. <laughs> Chelsea says a clairvoyant. Kim says, a criminal profiler. It was fucking wild. Uh, Chelsea's going to get 250 more points because the police are desperate at this point and brought in clairvoyant Ann Fisher, who inspects the scene of the Hederman Byron case. And would you believe it? Nothing came of it. (laughs) I like that clairvoyant is a specialist. You know, it's funny that you say that. Because if you'll see how I phrased the question... 
did, I, but I didn't. I, I didn't know if I should do the air quotes because it might make it too obvious as to which one I was. Uh, that absolutely. Mm-hmm. Would. Yeah. So. I forgot to ask if you had quotes around specialists. <laughs> then I would. I didn't ask the question. I would have known. See, <laughs> idiot. <laughs> Sucks to suck. Okay, so clairvoyant and Fisher inspected the scene. Nothing comes of it. In 1976. Later, uh, he possibly commits another murder that he may be connected to. I don't have a ton of information because it's just something that he's suspected of, and I barely had information about what he he did anyway uh december 26 1976 he's interviewed in joe early's madison avenue office uh, about the gray hair uh later in december 76 a hair matching the sample of lemuel smith's hair is found on joan richberg's body december 23rd of 1976 question number nine lemuel breaks into a department store what did he take Was it A, money, B, tape, C, rope, or D, knives? It's a department store? Department store. It's got anything you need in all the departments. Uh, Kim, what'd you say? What'd he he steal? He said he stole them knives. I picked this because I felt like it was out of place, so maybe. Tape. Chelsea says tape and... Of course, 250 more points because for whatever reason, Lemuel breaks into a department store and steals like armfuls of adhesive tape. <laughs> because it doesn't make sense. Like I would steal expensive things, but tape. He, I mean, he just had a purpose. He's like, yo, you ever tape somebody to a goalpost? It takes a lot of tape. Maybe trying they to, had fancy tape there he wanted. Adhesive. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Baby Bigfoot in the place. Woo, woo. All up in it. 2,000 points. Kim's got 500. Not too late, Kim. If you want to start scoring now. Now's oh, the time. Should I start now? You start whenever you want. I don't know. Maybe I'll wait for one more. <laughs> I really like a challenge. Yeah. That's so, a crusher at the end. <laughs> a real underdog story. In 1977, <laughs> at 36, Lemuel is is diagnosed as a paranoid schizophrenic by Dr. Z. Klopt. Can you pronounce that name for me, Greg? Z-V-I K-L-O-P-L-T. Z. Klopt. Z. Klopt. Yeah, that's, that was the best one. Congratulations. <laughs> you, Chelsea wins another 200. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> like, yeah, fuck, I mean, stop. I got, I got really, I got nothing. For no, that. come on. I want to hear it once. Come on. Yeah, dude. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Just, <laughs> Nah. Sound it out. How? Zvi Klopulus. The last one, his last name's an onomatopoeia for sure. <laughs> You're hooked on phonics, right? It's then. just Zvi. <laughs> In 1977, he's uh, diagnosed as schizophrenic by Dr. Zvi. Uh, in 77, Eleanor Lee becomes Smith's social worker. In 1977, later he's diagnosed with multiple personality disorders, uh, by doctors and his social worker, Eleanor Lee. Uh, I wonder if Dr. was there again. Uh, in 1977, he is given an EEG, which shows that there was no lasting brain damage from any of his childhood injuries. So he's got no excuses. All right. The, that's what they say. They've looked at his brain and all those head injuries. They said like there, I mean, there's no like long term effects. He's not, there's no, like Greg was saying, his reasoning center or anything. Because, you know, sometimes they will. They'll look at killers and they can see like, oh, fuck. Mm-hmm. You see this, yeah. you see this spot that looks Remember like my thumb? Remember he got hit by a car when he was a little kid? <laughs> trauma! That's what it did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this dark area here that looks like my thumbprint, that's trauma. <laughs> so, um... He's, I guess for me, that's interesting to know that they're like, it's something that they wanted to look at. Like, let's see this motherfucker's brain because he's obviously bringing it up. They don't know about his childhood head injuries, but he's probably like, man, I'm so fucked up because my brain got scrambled. And it's like oatmeal in there, man. <laughs> and, like Miles Austin. Yeah. <laughs> uh, or Austin Collie, oddly both Austins. Uh, What's this guy's middle name? <laughs> On January 10th, 1977. Lemuel he, Austin. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he stalks Denise Beulah Southwell's granddaughter. Uh, I just like the name Beulah a lot. 
Uh, he tries to kidnap Denise from her grandmother Beulah Southwell's store and holds a gun to Beulah's head to try to get it done and threatens to kill her. However, he is not successful in his attempts. In February of 1977, a social worker, Eleanor, Eleanor Lee, submits a report saying that Lemuel is paranoid schizophrenic. On summer of 1977, he begins stalking a woman named April, April Grace or Grachi. Uh, later in August 77, he has questioned the detective's office about uh, in Colony with his lawyer, Sandy Rosenblum, present about his stalking charges and some of his past. I like Garachi. Go with that. <laughs> cool. A- August 19th, 1977, he calls April Garachi three times and kidnaps and rapes April Garachi from her law office where she worked and later arrested for the crime. God damn it, I didn't know that was coming up. Now I feel like we got to really figure it out. What could it could be <laughs> Garace. It's G E R A C E. Garace, Grace, Garace. So she's like telling her co workers, like, this fucking weird guy keeps calling me, and now he's calling me at work. Like, what the fuck do I do? And then she like doesn't come back from lunch. Hmm, did it, did it, it say how they met? Did I miss that? Uh, no. It just says that he like became infatuated with her and began stalking her. Mm. It's like, oh, man, he could so, have just maybe so seen her worse. from across the street and been like, yep. Yeah, that's so weird. <laughs> yep. That's the one. Um, the followed her in, was like, excuse me, that brunette that came through here, could you tell me her name, please? Right. Who knows? And they're like, oh, what a romantic. And they tell her, and yeah. Oh, knows? you mean April? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, how do you say that last name, though? You wrote it down here. I just... Uh... <laughs> She's like, no, you you, you say it. <laughs> <laughs> September 29th in 1977, the Schenectady DA, Skip Warris, indicted Smith for the murder of Mary Lee Wilson. That was that first murder where uh, she was a sex worker. Her body was badly mutilated, covered in bites. Eleanor nee is ca- Lee, his caseworker, sends a resignation letter to the Schenectady DA's office. She did not want to do that shit anymore. October of 1977, he is transported to Bleecker Stadium by Schenectady County Sheriff's deputies for a canine identification. He is identified by the dog three separate times. So this is one where they were tracking him, and dogs are, I guess, they don't like forget the scent that they're hitting on, and they can like totally recognize it again if they're presented with it. So th- instead of a visual lineup, they'll line up, 10 or 12 people, and I, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, people listening, but they bring the dog in, and the dog sniffs everybody and sits in front of and barks at the one that they had been chasing earlier that day or whatever it was, and that's how they can confirm that that, that is... Seems, I believe it. They're that, pretty seems like, that seems really circumstantial. Like, it wouldn't be admissible. Like, it seems like it would give them an idea of a place to look, but it doesn't seem like it would be admissible as evidence. I don't know, man. That's, I mean, a, it, that's it, an it officer of the well law. Maybe, but it just... No, me neither. I'm not. I am not a lawyer. No, no, no. I said that's an officer of the law. The dog, oh, absolutely. the dog is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know. I know. But I, I don't honestly know how, like, how that would work. But I mean, I, I get what you're saying. Like, maybe that's long enough to where it's like, okay, we can hold him for. Uh, well, that's why. Well, yeah. I think it's more like a okay, we need to take a look at this guy and maybe that guy over there. Yeah. Good job, you know Sparky. I mean? Here's a treat. Right. Make him put his little paw on his little doggy Bible. And... <laughs> I love that. On July 17th, 1978, Lemuel Smith went on trial at the Schenectady Courthouse before Judge George Strobel without a jury present. On July 21st, 1978, Lemuel is found guilty of robbery in the second degree and kidnapping of April Garachi. Uh, August 30th of 78, it is reported that Lemuel would attempt suicide, but I could not fucking find out how. Mm. So uh, this little fucking bitch trying to get out the easy way now. Mm-hmm. Fuck face ass Can't Lemuel Smith. Um, mm. But it was probably on like some Tylenol or something because he is not successful. <laughs> One be it. <laughs> um, after his suicide attempt, maybe something comes to light for him. I don't know if he just decided, you know, it's all coming down. I better just let him know. But he's going to confess to amount, an amount of murders. Mm. Question number 10. How many? Hmm. Closest to the answer gets 250 points. Can you repeat the year that this happened? Yeah, this would be in 1978. And we're talking murders total? That he's confessing to. We don't know if this is how many he's done. He sits down and says, look, I want to confess some murders. This is how many. Including the one he's already been convicted for? Or no? Separate from that. Uh, Unknown, Kim. Yeah. If I don't have all of the information, how am I supposed to answer the question? He's going to confess to an amount. So let's just say that yes, it does include that that because he's confessing to all of his murders, supposedly. Okay. Hmm. 
cheese getting grilled over here. Hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I heard a lot of talk about questions earlier. Yeah, it's just a line, though, because I you like to say it. You don't actually like I don't, questions. I don't actually want questions. You just like to say questions. I saw you peeking. I already, bitch, I already wrote it. <laughs> hey, did you give me a range? <laughs> oh, no, was I supposed to? This oh, is, wrong. this. you didn't give me enough post-it cards. Uh, I had to, it's oh. this. Oh, oh, I see, I see. I was I like, just, one to three. I was just, <laughs> between one and three? We've talked about more than I that. I was just but I'm saving the three. earth. I was just using double-sided. Well, I want to be able to see it. Saving the tree. Uh, okay. okay, Kim said 12. Chelsea said, I believe, was it 54? Mm-hmm. Damn, Shooting Chichu. high, dang. He seems a little wild. Uh, on this day, he's going to confess to five murders oh, to the New York shit. Police Academy, to DA Joe Carey. So Kim's going to get 250 more there, be it 750 now, within striking distance to Chelsea's 2,000. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right around the corner. You, <laughs> you got this. Oh, right hey, there. Uh, so what we're going to do here is, oh, actually, March 9th of 78, he's going to be sentenced 10 to 20 years for the rape of April Garachi by County Judge Lauren and Brown. So take a break here. Come back with a hella Greg story and question. Greg's got something for yous. So come back or we'll kill you. Welcome back, everybody. I don't have much to say until we get back to, uh, you know, serial killers. That's what I do. Uh, Greg here, he does the, uh, he's part of the uh, dark, creepy, unsolved, or otherwise mysterious realm that we uh, try to cover. So, Greg, if you will, please take it away. Okay. Um, I'm going to start it off with a question. It's for points. Ooh. Um, 
this is about remote viewing, the CIA doing remote viewing. You guys know what that is? Mm -hmm. Astral projection. Kim, uh, do you know what it is? What remote viewing is? Mm -hmm. Or astral projection. Yeah, he just looked and he said that. She's using her context clues. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, as, as is tradition with the CIA, they gave it a stupid fucking name. Um, but uh, the, the question is, what was the name that they gave it? Was it Project Grill Flame, Operation Afterburner, Project Strange Things, or Operation Remote View? <laughs> One of those is a little on the nose. <laughs> That's what? What the, it's the double bluff. Hide it in plain sight. <laughs> One more. Do it again. All of them? Mm -hmm. yeah. Project Grill Flame, mm -hmm. Operation Afterburner, Project Strange Things, Operation Remote View. Now, do I want to go on the nose? Or do I want to go opposite? I'm going I don't right. know. Okay. Chelsea said B. Kim Operation said, Afterburner. on the nose, remote view. Uh, it is Project Grill Flame. Ooh. That was like my last choice. Which is under the umbrella of Operation Stargate. Oh. SG-1? Uh, SG-0. Ooh. Yeah. No, they, um, <laughs> that's the one with Richard Dean Anderson, future <laughs> MacGyver. Um. <laughs> So these guys, uh, no, uh, Project Grill Flame went from like, in like their <laughs> synopsis was uh, 1981 to 1984. And it was like, that it was supposed to test like whether or not this was even possible and doable and like something worth pursuing. And they would have these guys uh, remote view around the world and check stuff out and gather intelligence based on a picture and all that um at one point in 1984 they even had a guy remote view to mars at like 1 million bc and then go further back in time and like interact with a species there who was dying after some sort of apocalyptic event and he traveled with them a little bit and yeah so that's um stuff that like our quote-unquote government is a part of and spending time and money on and saying happened. Yeah, exactly. I mean, these, yeah, these, these transcripts that I, that I read are from the, uh, CIA government library. Like they're from, they're from the FOIA libraries, the freedom of information act. So it's all stuff that happened. That um, it. and they're all what Chelsea is confused about how real it is now. You just blew her entire universe. Yeah, no. If you go, if you just Google CIA library, uh, you, it'll take you to the to the right to the page that has their Freedom of Information Act stuff, and you can search keywords in there, and it'll pull up a list of everything that the CIA has in their library regarding that. Doing that's it. that that's that's public knowledge. Like there's stuff that gets declassified every year because after have, fifty, it gets declassified, right? It's not necessarily after fifty. It's just stuff that they put off in the future, so basically everybody involved is dead. I see. So that so that either one, it doesn't matter if their name gets out, or B, they can pin stuff on them because they're dead. So I see who's gonna who's who, they're not gonna defend themselves. Very good. Um, Interesting. Here yeah, it's pretty it, it's pretty fucked up, but it's kind of cool because these guys are like uh, April twenty fourth, nineteen eighty, um, at ten a.m. The mission today was to go to the U.S. Embassy compound, identify any hostages and all hostages at the location, describe the security of the location to include the guards. So this is during the Iranian hostage crisis. Mm -hmm. And they were using these guys to, like, scope out the facility before they went in. And that I almost like said this earlier. seems like way beyond its years. What's that? That seems like beyond its years. Like, that, that should well, have been a thing Well, see, they've been, they've, been, they've been cracking on this shit since the 40s. And the the uh, Nazi Germany was cracking on this shit in the 30s, so that's why we were cracking at it on the 40s. It was yeah, a race we after and we lost after Germany quote unquote lost the war. Uh, we borrowed they, quite a few of their scientists, which is you know what's fucked up. This document that I or documentary that I watched last night uh, talked about how the people that were that were funding the Germans during World War II 
were American companies. Mm. Ford, like all the tanks were for Ford tanks um, made with, you know, American ball bearings and, you know. Capitalism, man. Yeah, no, absolutely. Like Coca-Cola was airdropping uh, Coke to like Nazis. And these guys would like, <laughs> like couldn't very well have Pepsi products behind the German lines. Well, what, I mean, what, the, what what killed me is these guys are talking about they would land in the desert because that was it was safe. Like they would they would land their planes like the Luftwaffe, and they would get out, and then they'd unwrap a Coca Cola that they had bottled up or they had wrapped up in a towel. And they'd unwrap and just enjoy a Coke in the desert, and then nice get back to Coke. being being Nazis. <laughs> like, <laughs> what the back, fuck? Back to work. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's like I mean, it just imagine it framed like a Coca Cola commercial. Now it's like, Psst, mm. <laughs> like oh, yeah, do a little Hitler salute back in the plane. <laughs> the little Hitler salute. I like that. <clears throat> Not full, yeah. just small. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the alligator arm it. <laughs> but Lazy after ass, all, Coca Cola is a family friendly company. <laughs> oh my God. Look at all their Christmas commercials. <laughs> Definitely don't have any Hanukkah commercials. Just saying. Um, <laughs> doesn't seem untrue. I don't know. I'm not part of that demographic. Maybe I'm just not getting those ads because they know. <laughs> no, kidding. but like I mean, so uh, this shit has been going on for a long time. It allegedly started in '81. This is from 1980. So they were. I don't know if they were just desperate to get these people back or if they were just like experimenting with some shit. Because this is still under um, Project Grow Flame, but it's not like actually technically within the window that they described in the summary of project grill flame it's it's earlier yeah and they, i've seen I, I read a couple earlier from uh 1979 so they're even you know two two and a half years off of when the project allegedly started hmm. um and what what fucks me up is that at the end of all of these transcripts there are um drawings of the things that the guys saw and so you can, I mean, you can you can go down, you scroll down you to the bottom, them. it's like, you know, 24 pages or whatever, and you just scroll down to the bottom, and there's, like, the sketches of the, like, what did you see? And you look at it, and like, what the fuck is that? And then you turn your head to the side, and you're like, oh, shit, that's a building. I get it. And, like, huh. yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting. What pisses me off is that I read the transcript from the guy who went to Mars, allegedly, and there was no, there were no sketches involved with anything that, he had and he was talking about going inside craft and seeing people and i mean there's definitely sketches of people and there's sketches like in one of the things like oh i'm not an artist well and then that that, that's that's kind of the whole thing is that these guys are supposed to just be feeling it like it doesn't matter like we'll make sense of it after you sketch it just sketch it they're always asking for like raw data like in the mars one the guys said you know everything's yellow like okra like because, <laughs> because they're because that's the only thing he could relate it to and they're always oh, talking about them. overlays like he saw a big monolith and he was think he said he kept getting uh washington monument overlays but he knew it wasn't the Mosh- washington monument because he's on mars a million years bc what? so what it's kind of like <clears throat> um it, it, his brain can't identify what it is that he's seeing so it fills in the space with something that looks similar like your brain does that all day every day that's like what your peripheral vision is so like a lot of people like will say that they've like pulled out of their driveway and been t-bone and they swear that there was nobody coming from down the street it's just that you've seen nobody come down the street a million times in your mind Mm -hmm. so your brain puts Mm -hmm. nobody coming down the street when you're backing out and just glancing over it's similar like he sees this giant rock and the only thing his brain is like replacing it with what something he knows is familiar is the washington monument and it's not so much that he's seen you know giant rocks a thousand times it's that he's looking at this at this structure and he can't understand what it is and by his knowledge it shouldn't be yeah like so um, imagine i mean you, you can't really imagine but imagine seeing something you've never seen before a structure you've never seen before in a in a place you've never been before in a time that doesn't even really seem possible and watching something like i mean this guy went so far back in time staying in one stationary location that he was watching the dunes change on the surface of mars he was watching the sand dunes change what? that's crazy yeah so he he sees this stuff but like so these guys here they're he's talking about um an entrance to a building uh people standing in it it's got wood paneling red brick floor there's no there's no guard near the door they all appear to be inside the light is open the right is an opening in the wall looks very large living room type area 
The left is a hallway that goes to the right. The hallway goes down maybe 50 feet, then goes to the left. So these guys are giving detailed descriptions of the building, and they're trying to like gather as much plan. intelligence mm-hmm. as possible so that they can make a map so that these guys that are going to go in and try and save the hostages have an actual floor plan or the best thing that they can get besides an actual floor plan That's to go cool. in there and do this. And it seems on the up and up, but, you know, power, all, what is it? Uh, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. So once these guys are capable of remote viewing to this guy and saying, oh, yeah, he's safe in this room. If you go in through this door, you're not going to shoot him. Like, what's to say that they don't just remote view into wherever you happen to be anytime you happen to be there? All right. True like, scenes. it's the same thing with the Patriot Act that everybody was so on board with after 9-11. Like, you give up a little bit of the freedom for security. You're like, oh, yeah, you know, they should they should be monitoring terrorists. Yeah. Well, then the definition of terrorist kind of got broadened and broadened a little further and broadened a little further. And then we're, they were like, well, now we're just going to search for uh, keywords in an algorithm. It's just everybody. Like, uh, that way we can, you know, really find stuff before it happens. And now everybody's monitored. They can, anybody can look through your camera. You know, your phones are all listening. Any device you have is listening. So you give up a little bit of this stuff. But this is the kind of technology that they're working on in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. I'm assuming 90s. We'll see it in the next, you know, 10, 15 years when stuff from the 90s starts getting becoming uh, public, classified, and brought out. And that'll be cool. Yeah, I mean, there's gonna be there's gonna be stuff that in, in our lifetime that's declassified because the people are gonna die, and it's gonna be fucking. There's gonna be some shit, man. Like um, hit the fan. That is a podcast right there. There's there's uh, stuff that's slated to be declassified in 2050 about Kennedy. I so, I to see it. dang, I was gonna say twenty fifty, huh? Twenty. They 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 blocked that shit for ninety years. That's crazy. That I, shit think I, can, what, I mean, I'll be sixty three. Yeah, that shit oh, happened God. in in sixty three, wasn't it? Yeah, November twenty second, nineteen sixty three, and <clears throat> yeah, like so they 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 blocked that shit out for ninety years to make sure that everybody involved in that and possibly the it's next gone. generation of people involved in that are dead and fucking gone. That's nuts. And yeah, because yeah. I was born twenty. Four years after it, and I still might not make it. Yeah, so they try to do like it. that's well Thorough because job. when you when you when like I mean again this is this all goes back to this giant ass documentary I watched last night. Um, for anybody interested, it's called uh, JFK to nine eleven. Everything's a rich man's trick. It has very low production quality, but it's got a lot of really good information. Um, <laughs> it's, like, it's like three and a half hours long, mm. but it um. They talk about where the actual shot that killed JFK came from, um, an upward angle, so it had to come from down low. Came from a, a and Lyndon B. Johnson. Not no, he uh, no, it came from the um, sewer grate. Uh, I see. The the storm drain. That's the word. Um, but yeah, I mean, they, all, all this shit. They talk about they talk about all this shit and how stuff's not. There's stuff slated to be declassified in 2050, but they talk about. Uh, George H.W. Bush standing there outside the book depository, hands in his pockets, smiling. There's a picture of him, allegedly. And so they've got this information. And like, so, so George Bush Sr. dies. And then suppose all this information comes out and becomes public knowledge. In fact, that it, in fact, yeah, George Bush, as the director of the CIA at the time, got his Texas oil friends to fund the assassination of the president. And suppose that becomes public knowledge. People would be calling for George W. Bush's head on a stick. Mm -hmm. And when in reality, he had nothing to do with it, but then they can make the connections of his brother. Who's a business mogul, his other brother, who's a nerdy politician, his sister who married one of the, uh, one of the Koch brothers who's like, who are just like fucking loaded rich. So, I mean, these families have a trillion trillions in dollars in worth. And they're, playing god with like the system and then they spend our money on shit like remote viewing to mars in a million years bc (laughs) and i don't know i think i kind of got off topic and the original thing doesn't sound as much fun anymore but just go watch the documentary 
go for, yeah dude seriously block out like three and a half hours Bro, block out four so you have some time to process afterwards <laughs> Well, and, seems add, right. and add 30 so we can have a break in the middle. Yeah. I uh I definitely uh downloaded it and saved it. And the guy's trying to he's trying to crowdfund a second uh sequel to it, so you know. He's at like twenty five hundred and sixty dollars of three million. Tell him the name again. Uh it was JFK, JFK to nine eleven, everything's a rich man's trick. And tell him again where to find all the FOIA stuff. Uh, CIA library. You can just Google CIA library, FOIA, Freedom of Information Act, and you'll find all that shit. So join Greg in his search for uh, information. In fact, yeah, there's because there's a lot of they they name a lot of names in that documentary. So I uh, I think what I'm gonna do later is probably watch it again and then open up the CIA library next, like in the Type other the screen, names in and just kind of play along at home and see a lot of these guys because these guys are like really really candid about it these guys who were on these cuban hit squads and shit like that who were american mercenaries who were ex-marines and you know saying shit like when his girlfriend or whatever asked him did you just kill the president and he said fuck it doesn't matter like yeah probably like somebody did and there's you know eight people set up with a secondary sniper over their shoulder and radio men to coordinate the whole thing like i mean there's documents and there's proof and I want to play along. I want to, I want to go through it. So I suggest you do the same, do it. So if you guys want to hear more of, uh, Greg's, uh, conspiracies, make sure you're giving $5 to the Patreon because starting in season five, you will be getting at least two episodes a month of Greg's video podcast, hella conspiracies. Yes. So yeah, check out, uh, some of that information from some of those sources Greg gave you. And I'm sure you guys will be just as crazy and Greg as Greg in no time. Yay. <laughs> lonely here by myself. <laughs> Remember, the secret knock to the bunker door is... I'm just kidding. No, I won't, no, I won't, no. I won't, I won't give it to him. I won't give him two pieces of I information. I got one of those Bob one Lazar day. hand scanners. <laughs> okay, well, thank you, Greg, for uh, your uh, outlook on conspiracies, the American government, and... Uh, uh, possible jfk assassination theories i can't wait till 20 50. 20 fuck man <laughs> jesus christ it's so long. hey on the real though if we run for president and vice president like we talked about we'll get that information sooner <laughs> that's true i just um i mean like i'm feeling like a green party candidate though you know like we're gonna get out there but are we, are we, gonna, are we gonna make it what if we start promising shit like the full disclosure mm, it's not bad it's not bad Plus, the internet, the internet would love us. They we, they could meme us to the top. I'm meme I'm us. for it, dude. I'm for it. Okay, well, uh, <laughs> thank you, Greg. Everybody go find their, your FOIA information. Shoot it to Greg. Um, maybe he'll even ask you to be on the show. I don't know. He's, he's The bunker is a, a private place, but you can do it from across the internet. So uh, VPNs and firewalls and, and such. And, and other technical words. <laughs> You should just write some on a whiteboard so you, you can just say them every now and again. Bin binary. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay, let's jump back to the wonderful story of uh, Lemuel Smith. I do have a little side story of my own, too, to end it as well. So, you know, we're just going to stay here all night. On January 5th of 1979, remember, he's just been sentenced to 10 to 20 years for the rape of April, April Garachi by Judge Lauren Brown. Uh, January 5th, trial date is set for the murders of Margaret Byron and Robert Henderman. Uh, the religious store owners. On February 2nd, he is found guilty of four counts of second-degree murder and on one count of robbery. February 20th of 79, Judge John Klein sentenced Lemuel Smith to two consecutive life sentences of 25 years. Uh, so he gets 50 years on top of what he had just been given, what was it, 10 to 20. Uh, Lemuel begins serving his sentence, and in spring of 1981, he begins fixating on a prison guard, Donna Pant, who is uh, said to be very friendly with him and perhaps took this, he perhaps took this the wrong way. Donna, I think it's Pyant. Donna Pyant was once uh, one of the first women ever to be hired to work at this men's supermax prison, Greenhaven Correctional Facility. She faces constant harassment from not only the prisoners, but her male co-workers. So she was hired in like a wave of the first women, like there was like eight women who came in to be the first women ever in like the United States to work at a supermax facility. And it I was, picture it being very Lisa playing football. Uh, Lemuel Smith starts um, kind of falling for Donna Pyant 
And I think he's taking her being friendly in the prisoner CO kind of way as like, whoa, she's not being an absolute fucking asshole and like kicking me in the face. Um, She actually at one point files a sexual harassment suit against the prison uh, and some of its employees before eventually dropping it. And it is said that this raised a ton of tension at the prison. uh, So she was like never treated the same again. Mm. On May 15th, 1981, Donna Payant is on duty with two other male officers when she receives a call from Lemuel, who had actually been given a fair amount of freedom as a trusted prisoner uh, working in the chaplain's office. Uh, At this time, he was in the chaplain's office and called out to her post. So essentially, one of the male officers answered, knew who it was, and like to talk shit on her was like, oh, you have a call from a prisoner. And so she takes the call, and it pissed her off that he called her like on her post from the chaplain's office. And so she's like, I'm going to fucking handle this. And like, you can't call me like this. I'm going to handle this. So she hangs up and she goes over to the chaplain's office to tell him pretty much like, dude, we're not fucking friends. Like I'm your CO. Um, So when he, she gets to the chaplain's office, um, he has a surprise for her. That's what he had called for to tell her that he had a surprise. And she, at some point had mentioned wanting to get a jewelry box for her daughter or her niece or something like that. And so Lemuel had made her one in the prison's workshop. Um, most people believe that she turned it down and reminded him that they weren't friends, but prisoner and CO. And for whatever reason, the chaplain's office was empty this day besides Lemuel Smith, who had been given a key. Uh, so there's a lot of controversy about this prison at this time about like a lot of, uh, they said good old boy connections, uh, where like a lot of guards and prisoners were kind of just like exchanging favors and goods in ways that like, prisoners had way more freedom than was necessary and guards could get away with just about whatever the fuck they wanted with the assistance of the prisoners. So glad that doesn't happen anymore. (laughs) (laughs) So uh, they believe that she turned it down, reminded him of their actual relationship. The next events will probably forever remain a mystery, but it is believed that at this point he knocks out rapes and kills corrections officer Donna Payant inside the prison. Um, he just, he disposes of her in a dumpster by wrapping her in trash bags. Like an hour later, all of the guards are due to do a roll call, which they do, I think every two hours or whatever it is. And she's absent from the roll call. They put the prison on lockdown. They're looking around and like, she essentially is missing inside a supermax facility. So imagine this. I mean, it's 1981 too. It's not 1912 or something. So in 1981, a 31-year-old female prison guard. How were there no security cameras in the chaplain's office? I don't know. Or maybe there were. And, you know, I don't know. I guess there's not. I mean, 81's not really like. they Okay, but they absolutely had them. Yeah, I'm not saying it didn't didn't exist, but like. Absolutely had like little grainy black and white video to see something. Yeah, I guess. I guess in the chaplain's office. Or maybe it was out of view. He knew where it was. I don't don't have the details of that. Yeah, so. Uh, There definitely wasn't, though, because there's going to be a case about it. Uh, The following day, May 16th, 1981, Donna Payant's body is found at the Amenia Landfill by workers of the landfill who had already accidentally ran the body over slightly with a bulldozer. So this is where the prison trash goes. She's found there. Uh, To add to the issue, the trash truck's compactor had also done quite a bit of damage to Donna Payant. Every bone in her body had been broken. Um, but for the most part, still recognizable as the woman she had once been. So between the compactor and the bulldozer run, cause the bulldozer just runs over and flattens the trash and makes room for more trash. And they r- riding over her had ripped open the trash bag and realized that it was a woman. Oh my yes. God. Yeah. So she, they ran over her and some trash, I think is the idea. So she wasn't like, it broke the bones in her body, but it didn't like shred her into three pieces yeah. and you as know. if the trash compactor didn't break all the bones in her body. I feel like she, right. I mean, Jesus dude, which has always been a little bit of a fear of mine because I think it's child's play two or three. Somebody gets killed by Chucky like that. And, uh, only one I remember is the inside the trash, down the like slide. the yes. trash truck, the little rollers like in the factory or whatever. Oh yeah. And he mm. pops up at the bottom. Mm. That's, what, that's the only one I remember. And we had that, that kind of slide at Bicentennial park. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's found in the landfill. Run over slightly. um, Every bone is broken. One thing they noticed, though, uh, besides all of the other damage done to her body, are some very clear bite marks along her chest. He's a biter. 
a forensics expert recognized Lemuel's bite mark because he had worked on an earlier case where Lemuel had bitten Marley Wilson on the nose. So that body where he killed Mueller, one of the most significant pieces of evidence was a bite mark that like ran across the, the bridge bottom of her nose and her like upper lip. He had bit her in the face, but it was like super clean. So he was like mix, missing a bottom incisor. He had one ter- so tooth turn. Mm. So this forensic, forensic expert is so G that he literally saw this and was like, I recognize this mm-hmm. bite mark actually Damn. went to another case, pulled it up and he was like, Holy hell. So Lemuel Smith had bit, uh, obviously very bad teeth. So significant is the bad teeth that the forensic expert picked him out after just seeing it. January 20th, 1983 trial begins in Poughkeepsie, New York for the murder of Donna Payant. On March 9th, Dr. Levine tested the bite marks uh, on Donna Payant's body and said that they match Lemuel's dental pattern and the marks on Marley Wilson's body. Uh, Lemuel's defense argued that the body ran through a compactor and then over a partially ran over partially by a bulldozer that there was no way bite marks would still be there and appear cleanly. That's uh, what I was thinking. Like, how are they going to find bite marks after it went through a trash compactor and a bulldozer? So Lemuel theorizes that he was set up by the guards who didn't like Payant. And strangely enough, the sister of Diana Payant, Julie uh, Sari, believes the same. So she thinks that, and I, there's, I mean, like we said, there's just kind of a weird backward system at this prison that was happening at the time, and it's very controversial. And so the victim's sister believes that, because the conversation she had had, she doesn't just randomly believe it, but conversations she had had with her sister was leading her far more to believe that the, that it was possible that other guards would murder her other than, um, you know, some rogue prisoner. Yeah. Well, because she was whistleblowing. Yeah, and so Lemuel's like already in prison for life, and he there's interviews with him. You can see where he's just like, I don't know, like my dental because he he's in the interview. He's like, it's clear to see that it's mine. I can see that that's my bite mark. And then he says that you know it's ran through a compactor, it got ran over by a bulldozer, and you're telling me that these bite marks look like this. He said it wouldn't be hard for somebody to get my dental record and and make it look like that. You know, he said especially if you knew what you were doing. And so that's what he and his defense and the victim's sister believes that it was a cover up by uh, the prison and some prison guards there. Dang. They also I said mean, like, okay, yeah, maybe he killed her, but then how did he get her in trash bag? How did he get her out of the chaplain's office? How did he I get her thinking. into the trash? If the uh, bite marks survived, how were there any fingerprints on the trash bags on right. her body? The the um the room had been cleaned up with hot water. And a mop, but there were like several hairs in the mop closet. But the defense was like, how does that point out that it was Lemuel though? Like, you're just saying that you found hairs. Like, you didn't find fingerprint. Right. Like, so all you did is prove where the, where the crime took place. Right. So it was an open and shut case though. Lemuel's proven. He guilty. got railroaded. Is what uh, it sounds like. Well, who knows? I, he already I murdered. Know, well, <clears throat> it sounds like it wasn't a fair trial, which is getting railroaded. Sure. But I want to know. Who came up with it first? Was it Lemuel who was like, uh, it was the guards? Or was it the sister who was like, it was the guards? And he was like, yeah, fuck yeah, it was the guards. I Definitely not the sister. I don't think she was in contact with Lemuel. Like, I don't think they were like... Well, no, I, I mean, like, who... I just want to know, like, yeah, was, I, I get was the saying. sister like, oh, it was the guards, and he heard about it? Well, because he was on trial for it, and he was uh-huh. like, oh, yeah, fuck yeah. yeah. I don't know. That's a good point. Um, I do know that in March of 1983, at 41 years old, he is found guilty of first-degree murder of Donna Payan. So this is his first first-degree murder charge. June 7th, 1983, the New York Court of Appeals rejected Smith's appeal of his guilty verdict. And on June 10th, 1983, he is sentenced to death. In your face. Question oh. number 12. This one's going to be multiple choice. Um, Kim, I'll allow you to stab at it. You're so far behind. You you need to stab to be able to win this because the next one's multiple choice too. So, question number twelve: In what year did Lemuel Smith die? You could just you, you take a stab. I'll give you the multiple choice options. You got a big enough lead to where you're, you might as well just do that. Okay. Just She's playing like, strategy no, here. So write your write write down write down your stab. On what year he actually died? Yeah. Okay. What year was he sentenced? Say that again. Uh, 83. Are you going to stab as well? You, you're both welcome to. 41. He was 41 when he was sentenced to death. Well, I'm sorry, but Chelsea's going to get the points again. Uh, 
Even though I let you guys... Actually, nobody gets points because you stabbed and you didn't mm. get it. I um, but he is still alive. What? Yes, listeners to the show know that that's almost always for some reason the answer because these fucking assholes that seem to outlive everybody. Where is Because the good die young. Yeah. So June 19th, 1983 through August 20th of 1983, he sits on death row. That's right. Two months. Uh, August 20th is the reversal of the death penalty in the state of New York. So he is oh. resentenced to his fourth life sentence. Yeah. Um, in 2029, at the age of 88, he will be eligible for parole. Jesus Christ. Which he will not get, but he's going to be 88 anyway. So he's 77 now. He's very mm. much still alive. I don't yeah. know, dude. I bet he gets it. Yeah. I bet they're like, he's 88 years old. What are the fucking odds that he reoffends? Why not just give him, you know, a, a normal human do. quality of life for the last bit of his life? Yeah, I don't and know. I, I, I bet he gets his parole. We'll see. 2029. So we're waiting for 2029 and 2050. 10 years. Yeah. We there, we uh, there we go. What is it? Remind me. 10 <laughs> years. And remind Google, me. Remind 31. Me. 41 years. Good bot. No. 31, 31 years. Yeah. Okay. So, um... Kim, you can't win anymore. I'm sorry to tell what? you that. That was so close. There's just no, there's just no chance. But I do have a, a little Sucker. side. So that's Lemuel Smith, you guys. He's eligible for role in 2029. Can I see what he looks like? Yeah. Let's. Oh, there you go. Kim will show you. Okay. So for the side story, I've got a question up top anyway. Let's see if we can get some more points on here. Uh, question number 13. What is this story about? Is it A, a man killing his family? B, a missing woman comes back after five years. C, a kid outsmarting a killer. Or D, a whole town getting away with murder. The story you're about to tell us? Yep. That you couldn't possibly know. It's a blind guess. What is it about? Man killing his family, a woman missing, comes back five years later, kid outsmarting a killer, or a whole town getting away with murder? Chelsea says, an entire town getting away with murder. Kim says, a missing woman coming back after five years. Chelsea gets 250 more points. In your face. And <laughs> wins 2,250 to 750. Oh, BB. I'm oh, sorry. give her her prize. High five. Oh. <laughs> You're a winner in my eyes. Hey, next season, there's going to be prizes. Yeah, so, you so know, take that. In your cramming in your cram hole, Kim. <laughs> I was saying she won't give her her prize. Oh, okay. I thought you were like giving her shit about the fact that it's That's nothing. That's why I did this. I'm just kidding. It was. <laughs> yeah, you asshole. Stop okay. <laughs> so this article is published on the 17th of October, 2017 on morbidology.com. So this one is a, an article. This is not my writing. This is a written by Emily Thompson. It's called The Town That Got Away With Murder, Ken Rex McElroy. Uh, Skidmore is a small and modest town in Missouri situated approximately 80 miles northwest of Kansas City, consisting of around 440 residents and a number of small family-run businesses. The farming town revolved around work ethic. This was something um, that the town bully, Ken Rex McElroy, staunchly rebelled against. McElroy was never a popular man. Weighing in at approximately 270 pounds with the bushy black sideburns, McElroy held the entire town of Skidmore under his thumb. Always armed with a gun, McElroy took whatever he wanted, whenever he wanted, and nobody dared ask questions. Born in 1934, he was the 15th out of 16 children born to poor sharecroppers Tony and Mabel McElroy. Illiterate due to quitting school after just the fifth grade, trouble seemed to follow McElroy wherever he went. When McElroy was a young boy, he fell from a hay wagon on his family farm, and as a result, a steel plate was implanted into his head. Many question if this was the catalyst that caused him to become an abominable character and that eventually morphed into that he eventually morphed into. His criminal career started off with petty crimes such as stealing livestock, but this soon escalated predominantly into violence. Over the years, McElroy, who was a raging alcoholic and notorious womanizer, was married multiple times. He fathered a total of fifteen children with a horde of different women, many of them being just teenagers. Not one to care about the law or quite clearly morals, he met his youngest and last wife, Trina, in 1971 when she was just 12 years old. Did she... they really use the word horde? Yeah. Yeah, that's. I'm, I'm just reading. Uh... But also, this is not written by an American author, so it may have a different connotation across the, across pond. the pond. Yes. I still, I still feel like we could have maybe. She could have maybe said harem. <laughs> So, um, stable. Yeah. <laughs> just stable would have been good. Uh, unsurprisingly, McElroy, so she was 12 years old and she fell pregnant two years later at 14. 
Unsurprisingly, McElroy mistreated Trina, who eventually escaped to, or attempted to escape this evil clutches by fleeing to her parents' house with their newborn son. McElroy refused to let her go away that easily. He followed Trina to her parents' house, and once there, he shot their dog and set their house on fire before bringing Trina back home, where he physically abused her for, his, for her apparent misconduct. Trina revealed the arson and abuse to a local doctor who in turn called a social welfare agency and since she was only 14, put her into a foster home. Facing molestation charges due to Trina's young age, when he began a sexual relationship with her, McElroy discovered that if he were to marry Trina, then she would, not be, she would be exempt from testifying. He knew that all too well that Trina's testimony against him would be very damning. McElroy was granted permission by Mary to marry Trina by her panic-stricken parents after he threatened that if they did not grant permission, he would burn their new home to the ground. They reluctantly complied, and unlikely, the unlikely couple were married. Uh, throughout McElroy's well, tempestuous life, he, he had been indicted on a range of crimes, including child molestation, rape, attempted murder, and burglary. However, the citizens of Skidmore were so petrified of his brutality and the revenge that that could be potentially exacted upon them, that everybody refused to testify against him. The whole town knew how violent and unpredictable he was. His lawyer, Richard McFadden, would later say that he defended McElroy in at least three of or four felonies per year. It also seemed as though he was exempt from the law, at least until that fateful day when his reign of terror came to an abrupt halt when a vigilante justice took over. McElroy's ultimate downfall commenced in 1980 when one of his children, a daughter he had with Trina, was caught stealing a candy bar from a local grocery store. The grocery store was owned by 70-year-old Bo Bowenkamp and his elderly wife, Lois Bowenkamp. The Kansas City Star reported that Lois called the theft a misunderstanding and tried to make peace with the McElroy family. However, with McElroy being the hot-headed aggressor that he was, he, defu- he refused to let it slide and unleashed a barrage of terror on the elderly couple. First of all, McElroy offered the elderly Lois cash to engage in a fistfight with his much younger and stronger wife before turning to the intimidation tactics that he knew so well. So, like, while at the grocery store, he's like, I'll give you $50 if you just fight my wife, you bitch. Like, I'd do it. (laughs) The the one step he wouldn't take, I guess, was beating up an old woman, but he was totally down for his wife to do it. I would would straight up fight that guy's wife for $50. Yeah, so after... After she refused, he knew that he could just try to intimidate, and he took to sitting outside the Bowen Camp residence in his truck and every so often shooting his gun into the air as a warning sign. Quote, oh, he was intimidating, Lois Bowen Camp said. You can't know how awful it was. My neighbor and I took turns sleeping at night. The stalking and harassment of the Bowen Camp family took a tragic turn for the worse on a pleasant summer's night in July of 1980. Bo Bowen Camp was standing outside the loading dock, loading dock of his grocery store, awaiting an air conditioning repairman. McElroy drove up to the store, produced his shotgun, and shot the elderly man in the neck. Aww. Miraculously, Bo survived his wounds, but the senseless attempted murder was the last straw that broke the camel's back. This time, the small town of Skidmore would not forgive or forget this mindless attack on a defenseless and well-adored man. McElroy was soon convicted of the attack. However, he was released on bail awaiting appeal, much to the shock of the entire community. Within hours, McElroy was ready to exact his revenge on Bo Bowenkamp and the witnesses that testified against him. The town rallied together and wrote a number of letters to Missouri authorities, the governor, attorney general, and state legislators expressing that they were giving in... Uh, living in fear of McElroy and wanted to finally see some justice, but alas, their pleas were ignored. An exasperated McElroy was soon seen in D&G Tavern, his local haunt, brandishing an M1 rifle with a bayonet attached to the muzzle. This, of course, violated the terms of his bail. Richard McFadden, McElroy's lawyer, somehow managed to postpone his appeal hearing not once but twice, much to the townsfolk dismay. On the prickly hot afternoon of July 10th, 1981, the town gathered at Legion Hall to contemplate what to do about McElroy after the second postponement. The whole town was at the end of their tether and the, with the barrage of the intimidation and harassment that had been inflicted upon them. They were also extremely wary as to what McElroy was planning against them as revenge. <clears throat> Simultaneously, McElroy and Trina were sitting at the D&G Tavern having a couple beers and getting rowdy, completely oblivious to the uprising of the town. It's not. It feels like this is the Simpsons at Town Hall right now. Like everybody's about to grab their pitchfork and torches. Yeah, I got my 
torch. It's not exactly it known. Like everybody's about to just fall to shit in just like in, in seconds. Yeah, it's not exactly known what was being discussed in Legion Hall. Some think they were discussing how to keep witnesses safe, while others think they were planning a demise of McElroy. Whatever took place inside the hall, when the meeting ended, the townsfolk made their way to D&G Tavern, where they encountered McElroy and Trina climbing into a Chevy Silverado. McElroy was armed with his beloved rifle and a six-pack of beer. Moments later, shots rang out, and the town intimidator sat dead in his car, his bloody body riddled with bullets and his wife screaming in the front passenger seat. Ironically, he had been killed with the same sort of violence that he had reveled in over the years. At least 40 people witnessed McElroy being shot, and every single one refused to confess who had fired the fateful shots. Nobody saw a thing. Not one person called an ambulance as McElroy lay bleeding to death, surrounded by the wide eyes of the town he had once held in fear. As Postmaster Jim Hartman said, this is the fucking dopest quote I've ever. Jim Hartman is the fucking badass. Quote, I can't think of anyone who'd seen it. Uh, feel any different than you would about the people who invented penicillin. Nobody tried to hang them for finding a way to kill a germ. <laughs> oh, shit, Jim Hartman. Spicy. Damn. When police eventually arrived... They, a hot take. Yeah. When police eventually arrived, they discovered shell casings from both a twenty two caliber Magnum and an 8 millimeter Mauser. An investigation uncovered that McElroy had been shot by two separate people, one who had been positioned behind the truck while the other was positioned a half block in front of the truck. Regardless of the abundance of the witnesses to the murder which took place in broad daylight, nobody was ever charged with the jury when nobody was ever charged, and the jury concluded that McElroy was killed by a quote person or persons unknown. Trina claimed that she knew one of the shooters she knew who one of the shooters were, was, but with nobody to corroborate her claims, he could not be indicted. The town has kept its silence ever since, and they feel as though they owe nothing to a man who vandalized and terrorized them for decades. It is a true tale of comeuppance. That would have easily been avoided if the law and court had cracked down on McElroy when necessary. Quote, I know why they didn't talk. They were all glad he was dead. That town got away with murder, his attorney would later say. Huh. Yeehaw. That's crazy. <clears throat> so there you go. A little town uh, vigilante justice. And again, this was not uh, the 1880s. This was the 1980s in which this took place. Uh, so. I'm a fan. That's crazy. Don't fuck with Missouri. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that is That's mob justice right there. Yeah, that is everything I have for you guys tonight. Uh, is there anything you guys would like to share with the world before we uh, before we wrap up here? Anything you want to tell them? Anything you'd like to share with them? Uh, any any parting thoughts? X nay. The strong silent types. I see Kim is ready for sleepy town. She's got the hangover eyes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Greg. Yeah. Oh, that anything you like to share at the end of the show? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> um, at Hella Greg on all your favorite social medias. Mm. If I'm not, if you don't find me there, at Hella Greg, I'm not there. I don't exist. Tim, drop your handle. Mm, I don't accept randos. <laughs> Sorry, randos. <laughs> you can find Kim, but she's not gonna accept you. Ooh, unless she thinks you cute. <laughs> hey, maybe. Okay, well, thank you guys for coming out. It took a little longer than we anticipated, but that is uh, what we always anticipate. So, uh, <clears throat> thank you. Sound like us. Yeah. Uh, we get one more doctor. Yeah, doctor. Um, <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Smack it. The beard is very cushioning. Like, you don't understand. <laughs> oh, oh. Um, that was fun. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so, yeah, thank you guys for coming on. Thank you for hanging out. Uh, Check us out on everything if you guys can. Rate and review. Support on Patreon would be dope. A uh, bunch of new levels. Find some fun ones. There's a Paul level, a Bigfoot level, a Getty level. You know, everybody's got some levels now. Um, yeah, that's pretty much everything. Uh, thank you, Greg. Thank you, Chelsea. Thank you, Kim. And thank you, everybody, for listening to episode 96 of the Serial Chillers podcast. Don't talk to strangers.
presentation from Super Network.